and it's all now. So, um, where to start? So, the, so, so the, um, and, and I asked yesterday, and quite a few of you have used uh, random forest, and so are at least somewhat familiar with these methods. Um, in Dave is what I see as most students that, that come to my classes, they've taken some intro to statistics and they have heard of ANOVA and some have even have done some regression. And so most people are, are still heavily educated in sort of classical probabilistic experimental statistics. You have an hypothesis, you have an experiment, you make sure that you, know, you have the repetitions and you check that the variances are right and, and, and you, you have a p-value and if it's small enough, you've, you've, ha you've concluded that some variable is, imp is important and, and all that. And that's, that, there's, that's very important and that's not going away. Um, what has changed is that, that we have a lot of big noisy data sets that we also want to understand and that are not set up that way. That, that's one. And that and variables that, that appear to be, to the, to the best extent that we can understand them, not, not simple linear responses to something else we can measure. It seems to be complex things that you know, are difficult to explain in, in very simple terms. And so other methods have come up uh, to deal with that. And so the discussion we had, uh, had a, a, over, over in the break yesterday, so, so we had an interesting discussion, like, yeah, well, it's nice, you can do these random forest methods, and I'll talk a little bit about it, but then we lose this, and we lose that. And, and I was saying, well, not really. It, it, it kind of depends. So that's really what I'd like to talk a little bit about. But I'll try to be brief. I'll try to, and then depending if you have questions, or, uh, we, we can take a bit, a bit longer. But so let's, let's first look at, at sort of... Um, um, you know, GLM, so you know, generalized linear modeling. Um, so this is just you know, OLS, ordinary least squares, and maybe for this, and this is the data from the from the vignette. And here, maybe you'd want to do logistic regression. I'm not going to, you know, th I'm, this is just as a comparison. I'm somewhat worried about if this is meaningful, but this is what people tend to expect to get. Like, okay, I, I have a response variable and I have predictive variables. So PA, presence absence, is my my uh, response, my independent variable or my dependent variable, and then two independent ones. And I get estimates for coefficients and intercept and then coefficients and some p-value. So these are kind of hard to read, very small numbers as coefficients. Um, but you, you, know, you want to know if that's, is that, you know, is that big effect or a small effect. So the, these estimates are actually really important. And you say, oh, well, by one I can just drop because it's not significant. And, and this is highly significant, so that's really important. Uh, one thing I often notice is that people focus on the p-value much more than on the, est on the estimate of the coefficient, whereas I think the coefficient and the model fit after much more interesting. You know, some things may be significant, but really don't contribute much. Um, do we have an R square here? Um, why they are significant they don't contribute Well, fair enough. You, you, up to a point, that's not possible, but it could be if there's not much variation, it could, it could still be, yes, it's, it's significantly different from random. But it is not. But 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 the effect size is so small that it doesn't meaningfully mean much, and that's particularly the case when n is large. So, in fact, if n is very large, almost anything becomes significant, right? It's, it's very hard to get. Well, not not anything, but many many variables uh, become variable. Uh, and so what what you see also with, with spatial data that, that people do this kind of stuff, with, you know, where n is maybe a roster or so, thousands, ten thousand, hundred thousand observations. Um, and then they look at p-values, which I think is, is methodologically unsound. If you have essentially, because I would say in those cases, you probably just have the entire population anyway. You're not dealing with a very small sample from a theoretically infinite uh, s s uh, population, and then you have to estimate if your sample is representative. If your n is very large, then the difference is the difference, and that's it. Um, but what's still important, if it actually is, you know, so if you measure every, all the Norwegians and all the Swedes, and then you would say, well, the Swedes are one millimeter taller than the Norwegians, that could be statistically significant, but who cares? It's the same, all right? It would be very different. You would say, well, that's 10 centimeters. Well, that's actually big, so why would that be? Um, so that type of significance becomes more important then. But then when you have a, typically you have this, this heteroselastic relationship where you have the, the, or the treatment or the, or the parts of the variable of the independent variable which 
makes the dependent variable to rent to, to reach the higher values, it has also many times a bigger uh, a bigger variation. So in that case, is the 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 estimate are going to be generally low due to all this uh, you know all this heteroscedasticity along the relationship. In that case, you you will still think that, for example, I have, I have had uh, cases in which the estimate was quite low because the relationship between the training variable and the and the, and the variable of interest was triangular. Uh huh. <laughs> well, but. You know, that's but, that, but if that's the case, you want to you want to have a model that fits this relationship in that in that sense, right? Because then this starts to sound like your many of the assumptions that are behind these estimates of these coefficients were they're not in place to begin with, and, and and you might have an entirely misspecified model. I mean, it may, you know, so there there's some other issues, and that's that's also another problem. So what I see a lot is that because now you have these autocorrelated data and um, non independent you know non independent data, right? Um, Assumptions about orthogonal independent variables are not math, and then and then econometricians will will they they're really good in in you know they're writing pages about how they correct for all of that, just to keep everything within in this framework. Um, I feel that that they often overdo it. That there's just better ways than by forgetting that framework um, uh, altogether because it becomes so hard to really know where whether these adjustments actually are are meaningful or not. At least to me, not to them. So me, you know. But that's that's my impression, but but this is but this is this is all I'm all I'm showing here is this is basically what we expect, and then yeah you, you know there's all I say some things about it, but there's more much more you can say about it. Again, this, this and this book is it, it talks about about that and it talks about it. The nice thing about about this book is that these so these are these machine learning people, so statistical learning they call it. If you look, if you read Leo Breiman's paper, uh, the two cultures, uh, about 15 years old, I think 2001. Um, he developed some of these first methods, and he is an angry man, brilliant guy. He developed all these interesting new methods, and no one in the stats departments thought much of it. Like there was, there was, there was data mining, and it was, you know, that wasn't really what, what, what he was supposed to be doing. Um, so he's really upset. And he talks about well, he's really upset. He's somewhat upset. You didn't, it, so it's an interesting statistics paper, and he talks about. This type of modeling, where you impose a certain structure, um, and you estimate coefficients versus other methods where you don't impose much and you let the data speak for themselves. Um, and he talks about this two very different ways of thinking about the world. The thing, interesting thing, how that has changed. If you look at this book, there are no two cultures. It's really um, we just want to learn from data, and if the data um, support simple. OLS or near least square regression, and if you can do linear regression and the data fit it, well, that's what you want to do. It's really efficient, it's really elegant, and you're done, and it's great. It just happens to be that, that often it doesn't really work very well, or it's very difficult, and you have to start imposing all kinds of, of you know, interactions that you're not sure about, and, and, and um, stepwise regression, and eventually you find something, but who knows whether how, how stable it is. Um, Overfitting uh, is a problem, and so there's there's alternative methods, and so random forest is an alternative, and so let's just run that, and then we we'll talk a bit about more about what it does and what you get out of it. So this is a random forest model, and you do RF, um, it is a little bit different than what I did show yesterday because now we have a classification. Uh, Two variables try each split. We can talk a bit about more, and then and then an error rate of nine percent, and we have this confusion matrix. So in the test data, what was of the uh, two of the eight hundred known absences, seven hundred eighty-one were classified as absence, nineteen as present. So that's very good. Um, of the known presences, actually not so good. Most still get. Uh, uh, classified as absence, so the classification error is very high for the absences, but it's very good, for, or for the presence, it's very good for the um, absences or the backgrounds. Wouldn't the best be to, to just present all absences? So the error rate? To present all absences? To, to predict everything is absent? Yeah, well, that's, that's interesting, yeah. Um, would, would that be, a, would you do better? But, but because of this, if you just say 800, uh, everything is absent, then you still get about the same error rate, so you might not be doing better than, that's one extreme way to, um, uh, could be, we could try that. Um, well, let's say, uh, let's see, so, um, 
uh, I'm not so good in these. In these, uh, let's um, let's do this again. Um, so the problem here is that um, it's easier when we just have a, 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 a quantitative score. So nf train uh, class. That, so p oh, it is numeric. So why did we get? Oh, because model makes it a factor. Okay, so let's see. Um, M is P A is a function of. Well, let's do this later. But it's an interesting question. Um, so now we have this. So what does it tell us? It doesn't tell us anything about which variable is important. You know, no coefficient. Um, things like that. So, but but actually, we have, there's quite a lot we can do. So one 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 one. Um, Thing to look at um, is a, various, vari a variable importance plot. And it looks like this, and so it, it depending whether it's a it's a class or a, quant or a continuous variable, you get a different uh, score in the in the x axis here. So this is the mean decrease in the Gini coefficient. Otherwise, I think you get the node impurity or some measure. But essentially, what what how this is computed is. Um, well, I think there are different ways, but, but one, one way to compute this is to say, well, given that if I fitted a model, if I would now take bio 8 and it would randomize it, and I predict in the known cases, how much does the prediction change? Now, if bio 8 didn't contribute anything, it wouldn't matter, because whether you know what it is or you don't know what it is, it, you know, it's an unimportant variable. And so what you see here is that if you, change, if you, make, if you randomize bio 12 and 7, your, your model prediction decreases a lot. So apparently, so what it's found is that those are important predictors for this particular species. I think it's still the, the Bradypus, right? Um, or is this the Akaule? I forget which one it is. No, this is the Bradypus, so the, the sloth. So 12 and 7 are important, and even in, and 8 and, but, but it's kind of like, typically, actually, what, what my experience is you add up with quite a few at zero. They really don't matter. And, and typically one or two that are at the extreme. This is a bit of an odd case for me to see that they're all somewhat important. I mean, there's a difference, but they all contribute. So it's kind of, it seems to be very, the model that was fit is very complex, apparently. They're all important and they're all interacting in one way or another. Um, maybe that's because they only use two variables at each split, I'm not sure. But, that, that's, but, that, but it will tell us something. And of course, right now, this is, this is a bit abstract because we don't have any, you know, you don't even know what these bios are, but, but um, Assume you're fitting a model and you have some of these, but these, these variables say, oh, well, apparently these are important and does it make sense or not? Some of the other question. Yeah. Well, that's when you have a, have a, a continuous variable. Oh, okay. yeah. But because these are classes, it, it, it's, it's somewhat different uh, measure. No, you, you don't use Aikaiki here. So Aikaiki is used typically, uh, so classically, when you have two or three alternative models with, with you know, same data, different, per, uh, different uh, uh, variables, um, and you find out sort of, because you know if you add more variables to your model, you will get a better fit. And so Aikaiki gives a penalty to each variable because you want to, to have a simple, non-overfitted model. Um, over, these things are dealt with differently here, and I can talk a bit about how it's done here, but there's no such a, it's sort of, that's part of the internal model fitting. So we have that, and another thing you have is you can also say, well, it is Bio 12 is so important, so Bio 12 is annual rainfall. Well, let's see now what the response is to Bio 12. How, what, what does it actually say? Is more good or less good? But the other question. Uh, just one question. Um, here you're predicting classes. Yes. Can you predict continuous variables with that? Class? Yes. Like Yes. Yeah, and actually that's what I'm more used to, so I'm a bit confused by looking at this, because I typically do continuous variables. Even with 0 and 1, I just treat them as continuous. Okay. This now predicts either 0 or 1, but you can also say, well, you have zeros and 1s, and then you can predict 0 0.3 or 0 0.9 or um, closer to 1, closer to 0. 
but certainly you could also take, I think somebody asked that yesterday, you can have uh, species abundance. Uh, I've done this with you know, nitrous oxide emissions from soils. So you can, and so random forest is a very general uh, 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 approach to, to fit data. And, and really it can be any and I think it can be any type of response variable. Yeah. Yeah. So, so I'm not sure why this is so low. It is, but you know, I, I, the, um, so it seems a bit low to me. It, it's a it's a parameter you can set, but I didn't set it, so I just picked two. Um, and so, okay. So I I talked about that part a little bit yesterday. Um, so so the idea is card classification and regression trees. And you have data, and you make these splits. And maybe one more here, and maybe that's how you. And so, so if you say if bio one is uh, more than twenty, you go this way, and then here if bio two, uh, bio twelve is smaller than five, you go this way, etc. And, and then you get probabilities here, maybe zero, one, point five, point six, and point one. Who knows? So this this is a classification of regression tree, and these are nice, as I said. Oh, what did I do? <laughs> I can't touch them. <laughs> nice. I love it. Um, in the book, they say these are great, and people, you know, because this, this is closer to how we think about reality than maybe regression coefficients, and we, we, we you know, it's, it's relatively easy to understand, uh, to explain, you know, you can follow, and it's like a taxonomic key. Uh, so they're nice models, but they're, they're very uh, unstable in the sense that if you take a, a sample that's a little bit different, these rules change, the tree changes. So that's what they call, uh, there's a lot of variance. They use variance and bias about these terms, which are bad terms because they mean different things in different contexts, but I would say unstable. So if, so if, if you think about, yeah, this is made of a sample, uh, using the sam a sample of, of, of a reality, if you take another sample, it changes. Every time it changes. So we don't want that, right? So be, be, you, you, want, you want the model to be, be stable. Um, because it means, because it's not stable, it's also not a good predictor because you're, it, it's based on this particular sample rather than very general. And my computer went to sleep, that's what happened. Um, and so random forests deals with that, and it deals in ways, two, two ways. It, one, it, 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 so it fits it fits 500 of these trees, but it, what it does, it, each tree it fits, it doesn't take all the variables. In this case, it just takes two every time, which is very few, and I think that's probably one of the reasons why it, it's like this. Um, and we could we could try it again with more variables. So it takes a subset of the variables, fits a tree, another subset fits a tree, and so forth. And by default, 500 times you can you can find out if you need more or not. Uh, maybe on a thousand trees or 750. You know, you, there's there's ways to find sort of where that where how many you need. And so that's one way. Uh, and and it does that to to decorrelate the trees. If you don't do that, they, they the same splits tend to uh, happen all the time. And the, and then um, um, estimates are not so as robust. You want to be, be sort of somewhat independent. The other thing it does, it does uh, bootstrapping or bootstrap aggregation, bagging. And so it takes a few variables and then a bootstrap sample. So, it, so if you have, um, say, 100 records, it may take a sample of 100 with replacement. So some, some um, observations are used multiple times. Well, I'm just opening it up for you. Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, yeah. uh, what, did, what did you do additionally to explain your findings? Because well, okay, but that, I was going there, but, I, but I'll, I'll get back to that. But, but then I got another question to that, <laughs> that was about, okay, but what, is this, what, what was this? So this refers to these two variables, and that's just one way to, to get this sample of trees, which then are, you know, and, and I could plot them all in principle, but... Uh, ooh. <laughs> oh, that's, also, that's nice. That's, I figured that one out. Um, but it will look a little bit different. The magic of it is that if you, if you average over these 500 trees, now you get a very good predict, prediction, very stable and, and, and good prediction. And so, well, this is one thing we learned. Another thing we can learn is, is um, 
um, the, what's it called again? It's the partial plot. Let me see. So you could do partial plot RF and then X var. X var equals bio 12 was the important one. So let's see what does it. Okay, you need, need to give that prediction data, which is called NVAR inf train. Inf train. Okay, so this is the response to bio 12. So we can learn a lot. We can see, you know, and, and um, you know, I would say that, that, you know, it's a bit odd. I mean, the general shape I can understand, but, you know, obviously I don't believe so much in these things. That's just one of these, these artifacts you get, and you might use this and then generalize it and, you know, say, oh, this is sort of a negative exponential, you know, inversed, and then you can maybe do some uh, GLMs with this. But so basically it says, um, Well, what is the score here? One, two, three, four. Okay, that's hard. Oh, are there? Huh, I'm not sure what this class. So normally this would be the response, but I'm not sure what this is now. Um, clearly it goes down with rainfall. Um, but we only had classes of zero and one, so I'm not sure. Let's, uh, we should do this again with uh, quantitative data. Or with with uh, continuous data. Maybe let's just let's just do that. Um, so let's just run it again. I say p a is a function of all variables. There we go. Oh. Why is it a problem now? Okay. okay. All right. Now we have three variables at each split. Only explain 21% of the variation, not great. Um, but let's look at the partial plot. Well, it's, okay, that, that makes more sense to me. So this is now the probability or sort of probability type score between zero and one for this species to be present, or at least the environment to be similar to where it is relative to the background. So the rainfall is very low, and these are deciles in the observations. So if it's rainfall below about, what is it, you know, a little bit over 2,000 millimeters, it says, well, the species is not going to be there, not going to be very good. And then it shoots up and it plateaus out. So this is actually a very realistic biological response, like an S response to rainfall. Very nice. Um, which you can get with like models like GAMS or so, where you get big wiggling, which is odd. I mean, biological responses aren't, don't have that shape. You know, it's, in the end, it's all enzymes, really. So it's either something like this, or it goes up and maybe down, but if it's really up, if it's, if it's very uh, wiggly, if that's a term, um, I wouldn't trust it so much. So I'm not sure if bio 12 is still important. Um, for imp plot rf. Well, it is, but seven is about as important, as maybe it was before, so let's, let's see. It. So bio one is temperature. So that's also, uh, and so we should also be able to interpret by one. Well, that's that. So that seems quite odd. And so this is degrees Celsius times ten. So it basically says that. Uh, about fifteen degrees, it goes down up to twenty-five, say, and then it shoots up. Why would that be? Yeah, I mean, that's an odd, that, that doesn't make much sense, right? For a an, foreign species or like a... Maybe you didn't sample the whole temperature, right? So the data plays a role in the temperature of the whole sample. Yeah. 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 You can see these are sort of the deciles of the, of the observed data. So we really have not, nothing observed there. Um, or not much, so, it's, so it's, kind of, it's, it's, it's basically pretty much uncertain what, what's going on there. And then, uh, and then, but here you find, you know, they, they tend to be out here, so that's why it goes up here, I suppose, and maybe still going down, yeah. But then still why it goes, yeah, it's, 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 it's odd. And now what might be going on here is that there is some interaction. Uh, and so there's other plots you can make, uh, but I don't know the top of my head, where you sort of plot 
Bio 1 and Bio 12, and maybe there's some interaction going on, and you can explore that as well. So how are these computed? These are computed by, by saying, well, I have this model, um, and I can, I can make predictions for all these, because I have a model, I can make predictions for all these values of Bio 12. And what, what, what it does, it takes, say, 2,000 millimeters, and then of all our training data, it keeps the training data except for bio, as it is, except for bio 12, it sets it to 2000, and then computes all the predictions and averages that. So that's one value you would have here. And then it does the next value at, at these intervals. That's why it takes a little time to compute it. So it basically uses the model um, and all the, all the input data to, to compute these response curves. So I would say, well, we, 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 you know, we, we potentially could learn quite a bit of what this, what this data tells. Now, um, what I would find interesting, and I've never really seen a paper that does that, that says, well, okay, we've seen this now, and now I, this suggests that this is how this works. This is the type of response curves, and this is some interactions. So now I'm actually going to formally model that in, in a GLM, but I now know how, how I should set up, you know, this is clearly logistic, and there's an interaction here, and I'm going to put that in and then, and then test that. Or I'm going to take this to the field and test these hypotheses or, or something like that. Well, um, uh, there always is because, of, um, but, but um, so in this two cultures pra uh, paper, what 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 Brahman talks a lot about a uh, data set where, if you do log logistic regression, it might very well be that it picks up one and not the other one. Um, with random forest fields, will be that they should come out both as equally important because of this if this um, subsampling. You know, this one is important and the other one is not in here, so that one is important. Um, but it might well be that you say, oh, these two are important, uh, but if they're so similar, maybe you should just throw one out. And then that, that one that's left over becomes more important because it basically takes, um, it's, it's not that if you, because now you take it out and then the other one still has that information in it. So um, they're still good. Re so, so you could say that the method is not as sensitive to that, but there's still very good reasons to avoid highly correlated variables because it becomes just very difficult to interpret, as you, as you, as you said. So there's, there's still, so the fitting is not so much affected, but the interpretation, yes, is, is, is affected because yeah, you can't separate them. But you don't have to go to huge, so it's, it's less that you would have to go to PCA or so to make sure they're orthogonal. That, that is not really the case. But if they're highly correlated, yeah, then why not just take one of the two? Um, and you might, you, that you might do based on, oh, well, you know, if the model fit is not much affected or so, then I just, it, it will always help a little bit, but you could throw it out. Um, there's other issues. I mean, this is, so, so that came up yesterday. Somebody said, well, how does this take care of spatial autocorrelation? Yeah, spatial autocorrelation. So, one, one, so, so whether you do a GLM or you do this, we're dealing with spatial data. And if you do linear models, uh, people, you know, you write a paper and you submit it and you get this <laughs> reviewer say, oh, you're doing linear model with spatial data, all your assumptions are violated, I can't accept this. Start over. Anyone had that? <laughs> Some people are nodding. Um, and so, um, and there's quite some literature, and, and so Roger is very active in that field, and in, uh, certainly in, the, in developing methods for R, where you know, look at the residuals and you try to, uh, make a spatial weight matrix, and you reformulate your linear model to, to um, um, uh, re-estimate your, your coefficients. With um, these methods, and with, with, I've never seen um, anyone do that with, with random forests. Um, we could look at that. We could look at um, residuals, um, right? Because um, residuals or f. So we have them here. Ah, no, it doesn't read. That's odd. It doesn't have a residuals function, I suppose. Well, we could compute them. So the residuals is nothing. You know, it it's will be the prediction minus, ob minus observed, right? So we, we could produ uh, produce them, right? Because we can say, um, I think that will probably work, predict RF. So these would be the predictions, and we, um, we can compare them to uh, the observations. And you could plot them. I don't quite, I, I don't know really, I could, it would take me some time to figure out where these x, y's are. Well, maybe I should do that. Um, let's see. Uh, 
points. Well, I won't bore. I, I can set it up if you're interested, but let that probably take me five minutes to do, so I, don't, I won't let you wait. So we could, we could plot these. Um, Maybe, yeah, maybe I'll talk about that together with the cross-validation, because that in both cases, it, it has to, you know, some of the issues have to do with these spatial uh, uh, patterns. But, but, it's, but it's certainly important to, to realize that even though, you know, ecologists will refer to this tec these techniques that we're doing now as spatial modeling, that a lot of sort of the truly spatial characteristics of the data are entirely ignored. It's ignored whether this data frame of environmental data that we actually, you know, were, was it one clump of, of points, or was it very widespread? Um, where there are very similar climates in very, you know, very far away regions, or was it all, all really a very homogeneous region? You know, that you would think that that would help you, um, you know, learn different things and 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 uh, have better, you know, understand more uh, about your data. But none of that is, really, is, as far as I know, anyone is, is uh, no one is, is really dealing with that that I have seen. So that's great. Um, spatial statistics is a difficult topic. Um, and it's really underdeveloped. So there's, if, if you don't have any methodological work, there's, there's, there's uh, a lot that can be done. Um, if you're more practical, you just want to use the accepted methods and then be done with it, then yeah. <laughs> That's unfortunately not always available. Um, was there anything else I was going to say about machine learning? If the, if the data are especially autocorrelated, maybe one, one simple way to, do, to go is to put lap long within the... Well, you could. Yeah, I mean, certainly that's, you can use it as a predictor variable if you want. Yeah. Um, okay, the patch of would, in, would include position. So we uh, are suggesting don't, if I may comment. Uh, what you then need to need to do is that if you fit an effect in latitude and longitude, you have to wonder whether your solution remains the same if you would rotate the axis. Okay? So if you would, would sort of rotate them, would you hmm. still end up? What they do then often is use a two-dimensional spline, so a spline function in latitude and longitude at the same time. Right? So it's, it's, it becomes rotation invariant. If you get a model and the slides of the rotate, I mean, direction of axis are arbitrary, right? Mm -hmm. There's nothing special, I mean, north is north, but, you know, it could be southeast or something like that, that was a different region that you would orient towards another star. So, uh, so rotation invariant solutions are the preferred and the two dimensional splines, moving splines in, in, in both the or, or in fact, n-dimensional splines, because you would have other predictive variables as well. But that I could see that for an interpolation yeah, question. Low, low system, but if you want to smooth, yeah. let's say, uh, if you want to smooth a, a residual spatial autocorrelation effect, so to speak, then you could you could sort of absorb that. Oh, okay. Okay. That, okay. And, uh, yeah. It's smoother that, that is typically not an additive model in <coughs> latitude and longitude independently, but they use two-dimensional ones. That's a reasonable. I think the, the additive model is to do that. Yeah. The, the GAMS, yeah. The GAMS. Yeah. <laughs> actually, actually, Hasty is the, the, the inventor of GAMS, but I don't think, actually, there's not a chapter in there. Is there? No, no GAMS in here. Well, that's actually odd. Let's see if you're really brilliant, and even you're, you're, you don't, in your summary books, you don't even mention your your major inventions, because there's too much, too many other things to talk about. Um, so besides uh, hot correlation, uh, what's uh, this method of um, random forest not capable of? What's it not capable of? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, well, it, well, and it's, and it's certainly an appropriate method when you have large data sets and many variables, yeah. right? But, but and it's not only random forest. There, there's uh, uh, support vector machines. There's uh, boosted regression trees. So there's a whole series of of, of uh, algorithms that do these kind of things. And just like uh, uh, Tom is organizing here, you have these occasional uh, Bake Offs uh, competitions. So a very big one was, uh, was it uh, uh, Flickr? No, not Flickr, uh, uh, the vid uh, on-demand video streaming service that I subscribe to, but um, in Netflix, did somebody say that? Netflix in the United States, where, where um, 
And Amazon could have done the same thing where, where they basically, um, I think, wanted to predict you know, what other movie you would like. Right? So you just rented um, James Bond uh, 36, and then, or you clicked on that and you didn't want that, then they want to show you what else you might want to buy right? or, or, or pay for. And so that's another thing where these, this type of algorithm is used for, because you know all kinds of things about your customers and all kinds of other movies they've seen and demographic information, where they live. And, and so they had this, this, this test where you, know, you got a lot of training data and then, and then you can, or this, this, this uh, competition. Um, and you could win a big prize if you, you know, whoever predicted best. Actually, support vector machines is, is, is a result of one of these competitions. I think it could win $100,000, and somebody came up with this method, and they won. And we still have it, so it's a, it's a neat way to organize stuff. But so, so my answer is, um, I don't know, do you have any... any, any uh, if, if, you, if you care about inference, if you want to test hypothesis, you want to do something else, but then you probably have a very different data set to begin with. And, you know, hypothesis typically is, is, is very reduced, and you have... Um, only very few variables, typically only not have that much data either because you have to carefully design it. Not, that, not always, you know, but, um, um, and then you have, you have to make sure that, that all your uh, assumptions are met. But are, are there ideas about that? Or? Okay. No, I don't think so. And I think the reviewers are a bit, uh, I mean, naive about it often because it's, it, they're either, well, they, don't really know it, and this. Well, then they say, "Well, I don't know it. I don't want it." Or they say, "Well, I don't know it. It's so probably good." Or they say, "Or they mirror like me, like, oh, I know it. I think I know it, and I love it, so it's great." Um, the, the issues I think are always with the input data, and again with spatial data. Um, if if um, if your input data set is not very representative of 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 what you actually want to study, then it could be heavily biased, and and it could be a very inefficient model. Um, Another thing I would say, they're very good predictors within your domain. Where you can extrapolate with them is something very different. So, so a famous data set that Breimann worked on is the ozone data in Los Angeles. And predicting ozone levels tomorrow is a difficult problem. And, and it was important in Los Angeles because, you know, particularly back then when there was more pollution. And so people would need to know, can I go out tomorrow or not because of the ozone levels. And so it would be nice if you could predict that. And, 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 and he was able to do that quite well. Um, so that was a success. Um, now, could you take that model to Miami? No idea. You really have no idea. Probably not. So extrapolation is, and if you had a more, if you had some knowledge, and if you had someone understanding about the process that creates ozone, and you made a more classical model where at least you have those variables in there, you could probably take it to Miami. It might be somewhat biased, and the coefficients might be somewhat off, but at least you have some confidence in that the general responses are correct. Whereas here, you might just say, I have no idea. You know, this goes up and down, but it predicts well, so who cares? Um, so with extrapolation, you have to really be careful. So again, if, you know, if this, this sort of this, in the same holds in this context for climate change effects. It's one thing to take these points and very nicely recreate that range that, that's po that these points occupy, whether the... the, the the model actually describes what the species truly responds to uh, seems very unlikely to me, actually. Very unlikely if you have so many variables and, and, and such a neat fit. Uh, so I'm very sus uh, sus suspicious of that, but, it, but that's... You know, that's to, and you could, but you could test that in principle if you had species in different continents or things like that, but, um, um, or indeed it's historical data that I shown yesterday, and then, you, know, you can backcast. And, um, typically, what people find then, if you, if you do that, what you need to do is have very simple models. Fewer variables, fewer interactions. Um, you lose your fit on your current data, but you, you increase generality uh, and productivity. So it's again, it's sort of a, uh, a bias-variance trade-off that they, that they talk about in this book a lot. So yeah, it's not that, so yes, it's very general, and you can just throw data in, but there's, there's yeah, you still have to uh, keep thinking, I suppose. Yeah. But the reviewers, um, yeah, it's, it's not, yeah, you get away with a lot with it, I think, yeah. If that's, if that's, if that's, uh, if you're a, P, uh, you're a PC student, you just need to get your papers out, and it's a pretty safe bet, I think. <laughs> Yes, um, it is. Let me see. Um, I 
Let me see how that works. Um, somewhere there's all these trees, I think. 500, oh. This one here. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, I know, I know if you just run a cart, you can, you can, you can do it. Uh, I'm sure you, the, the data's in there. Ah. Don't ask if. <laughs> but I'm not sure, quite sure how. <laughs> but the data's in there, so it should, it should be able to. It should be possible to to, um, to plot them. And it's, and it's probably. I mean, you know, the, actually, the real way to figure it out is not to uh, try yourself, but um, plot tree from. Random forest. Now Google even knows what I want to ask. Is how to actually plot a sample tree? There you go. Stack exchange. Oh, you get a tree. Let's see any nice code here? So here's an example using actually the C forest package. So that's not the random forest package, but a different package. But uh, using the nice Iris data set uh, that Fisher worked on a lot also. Um, but so yeah, you can look it up. Um, but here you get the and, you know, so you get the you know smaller than this, smaller than that, and you get the the, the probabilities at the at the nodes at the at the leaves, I suppose they called. You gonna say something? Yeah. yeah. yeah well, the, I mean that is the issue with it's like neural networks. So random forest is like hundreds of thousands of trees um, and aggregate over them. Right. So your model. Can you hand it first, sorry. So random forest fit like hundreds of thousands of trees in the same you know, permutation, same data set. So your model is, is that's why it's called the forest. Right? It's a random forest, it's a collection of trees. Uh, so you can look at one tree, but it's very difficult to look at all thousands. Yeah. All thousands. So, but that is your model. If you wanted to do that, what you'd really want to do, then you'd run a card. And you get, you get this. But it's not equivalent to your 500 trees with randomized variables and and aggregate and and bootstrap data, but but you can do a cart and you can you can still try to interpret that, and yeah. But if you, even if it's if it's this uh, uh, like a summary of, of the of all the models. No, you can't. Yeah, but that's not. This is this is just one single tree, and you have 500 of them. And there. What's the P for? The P. This at new value. No. Oh, this, well, this, um, oh, it actually has a support here, yeah, P, that's interesting. Oh, okay, so maybe they do something here. Let's see what they, uh, yeah, you're right. That you have some kind of probability associated to the, to, to see, the of the Yes, yeah, so I'm not, I'm not sure, I'm not sure what, what, um, what this p-value stands for here. I'm not sure, you know, this is stack overflow, so I, you know, who knows, but, um, yeah, I don't know. Go figure, go figure it out. <laughs> yes? I have still a, a bit of problem of understanding how it works, because if you, if you have a decision tree, you end up in a category, right? You end up with a class that is being predicted. Uh, but if you're if you're applying the random forest, you may also achieve continuous variables. How is that possible? How is the well, we have a classification and regression tree, and so we either do classification, in which case we do end up with a class. If we do a regression tree, we don't. And so with random forest, the same way, you either have a lot of classifications. Or you have a lot of so it, it goes it, it both both work in both ways. So, so decision trees could can be continuous or predict continuous variables. No, you don't believe it. I mean, I mean that's still really how it would be. So point five, and like this one here, I think. Well, I suppose I'm not sure what this is all about, but I can't do this. Um, yeah. So then let's look, not look at this. Whatever this y is, but it seems to be a number of of, of things that are predicted here. But no, that's 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 um, very often, I guess, in practice, that's how it's used. But it doesn't have to be that way. Well, something like this: point one, point six, point five, one or zero, some some numbers. Oh, that's interesting. And okay. This is continuous, right? Because they're just numbers. You know, I I made them simple numbers, but it could be you know six one and. Five three one point one zero point nine. 
you don't. Yeah, you don't. Now, of course, if it's a very, it could be a very large tree, and you, so you could have a lot of numbers. But often, no, it's either 0.6 or 1. It's not considered. Uh, no, and, and, and again, you know, but in a single tree, no. But now you make 500, then it becomes continuous. Well, I'm not sure why, clearly not. No, if you have, if you have five, I mean, sort of, you get, you, you know, eventually all these, you know, and it gets averaged over these 500, so you average. Pieces of continuum, or, or like small dots in it, that point. No, but you have 500 trees, and, so, and so, you, so you make for your new data where you make a prediction tool, you get 500 predictions. Yeah, one is 0.8, one is 0.7, the other one is 0.6, because what, the values of these nodes will be different for all trees. Sure, Every tree will have different values. At, Each gives you one number for, 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 so for one record. So for one, so in this case of the species distribution modeling. So you, you want to say, okay, I, I fitted this data, and I want an estimate for um, um, downtown uh, Bergen, if the climate is suitable for, for um, lemmings. And so I take the climate for, the environment for, for downtown Bergen, and I fit these 500 trees with these data. And I, each tree is going to get somewhere, and you get a number. And so now I have 500 numbers, and I average that. And they, you know, so that becomes pretty much continuous-like. You know, it becomes, well, pretty much, it, it is, actually. Because if you, if you look at the predictions, the rosters, they're very. I know it looks like this. That's how we present it, but it's not in reality. Uh, I mean, <laughs> you know? Yeah. Well, for the single tree, no. I would, I would think it is. Yeah. Um, it's, it's, but it's the same thing. Like, if, if, if the it's, 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 I guess I guess if you if you throw the dice and you could say well, uh, or, or or a coin you can only have head or tails but if you throw it a hundred times so if, you know you, or what's the probability of throwing you know head head tail it becomes a continuous number because no well, you can only but you, how can it be continuous right because you can only have this bit how it sounds what you're saying yeah sure but I have all these different combinations and I average it and now it's a continuous number and it's different from tail, 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 head or, or not, I don't know. Um. I like the, I like the, the, by the way, if you, if you have to choose between classification or regression, so this, con what I refer to as continuous variable, but others might say semi-continuous variable, uh, I prefer much, very much this, co this continuous approach because in classification, what you would get is that essentially the algorithm says, well, it's 0.49% class A and 0.51% or 0.51% or class B, so it's going to be B, and they're very close, and you can't distinguish that. So I, I prefer to see the, the raw numbers. Um, and because, you know, if it's 90 versus 10%, it's something very different to me than, you know, 51 versus 49. Or 49.9 and 50.1. All right.
any, any shape. You, you, you could have. Yeah. Yes, you can, but then it's no longer a raster. And so, uh, or hexagons is, is popular too because they're sort of like circles, so they're a nice, nicer way to divide space. And so you would use polygons to represent that. Um, so in principle, it's possible that, um, for for species distribution modeling type things. It's less. It's not used really, but. For the other exercise, that, which is about summarizing you know, point distributions by rosters, you could just, well, it actually shows both. So the other one, the, the wild potato exercise, shows how you can map diversity patterns on rosters, but also you can do it by country, for example. So yeah, um, there's a hexagon out there that, that uh, how do you call that, net? That's, those are nice shapes. but. Um, Rectangular, not square. Yeah, they don't have to be square. They can be square. But. Actually, that's an odd thing with uh, S3. Their their grid has you know, had to be squares. Well, yeah. <laughs> well, it can, it, can, it can. I mean, if you, there, there are certain operations where it's really important. Like, you know, you can compute the area uh, for each cell, and it will tell you what it is by latitude, and you can do, and in the distance computations, it will take that into account. But otherwise, by and large, just, you know, if, if that's your, you, you, you can divide it into you know, equal degree cells. Which obviously all have a different. Well, each, each latitude is a different um, uh, area, so people understand that. So if you if you have latitude longitude grid for the whole world, and I talked about it this morning a bit with the projections that, I, that you know they they may all have the resolution of one by one degree or so, but the cells up north are really very small because that's where everything gets together. And if they're very small and they're on the North Pole, actually, well, the, the area will be zero. Or they try, yeah, that's, they become triangles like at, the, at, the, at the very point, yeah. So then you have um, three resolutions, the lower, the upper, and the, the sides. see these two packages, SD uh -huh. and uh, raster, mm -hmm. uh, should I focus on, I mean, can I focus on one of the two because I can get the same functionality of the other, or should I anyway have both in, uh, at hand? You want me to leave the room? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, raster depends on SP anyway, so, so you can't have raster without SP. Um, SP doesn't do that much. It sets up classes and then uh, some functions around it, but, but most people don't just use SP. They will use some other package that, you know, does, you know, SPDAP for spatial regression or GSTAT for Krieging or, or, well, and all these other packages. Um, Ruster implements a lot of functions for raster processing. So if you're going to do a lot of raster processing and merging them and aggregating them, and you'll be, you'll be uh, well advised to use the raster package. If you're not going to do that, then probably not. Now, you might be in between, so it's hard to say, but it, it, that, will, that, that will probably um, um, become self-evident as you, as you go along, depending on what you want to do. So what, what, do, you, what do you plan to do? which I was basically asked to provide some recommendations uh, on how to 
let's say, optimize the value chain in the biotechnology industry, in the bioeconomy. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to have companies from one side, I mean, a good man, a nice man, with companies from one side, maybe some analysis with distances and their operation, their activities, and uh, let's say, uh, sources of biomass. So in this respect, crops and uh, other, yeah. other things. Yeah. And so I was trying to see how can I uh, combine all those into one framework, into one map, and maybe come up with some results. But yet, it's still quite an abstract idea. Yeah, and, and you could probably implement it in, in a raster framework where you have tried to measure flows or compute distances. You could probably do it in a polygon framework or, or maybe even in a, in a network, a graph framework and so and so you would just you would do different packages depending on how you conceive the analytical methods and how you go, how you think of the data you know, how you want to um, represent the data given how you want to analyze them so um, you choose <laughs> you choose uh, I, I could, yeah, yeah. I mean, if, if you can't, well, maybe I don't ask this question, but can you explain spatial sorting bias a little bit? So okay, yeah. yeah, okay. I'll I'll prepare a little script and then, okay. um, then we can talk about it.
this to be pliable. Yeah. Um, well, it, if it's well, which so if you have a like the rest of well, what do you have? What, what do you want to say? Uh, uh, well, it says any of the raster format if I want to have it as a table format where I can value oh, for okay. itself. So which one should I use then? The original raster layers or? Well, raster layers is a nothing object. So you can, you can yeah. write your data to a GIS type files like a GeoTIFF. So you could do write raster object. Yeah, but comma. if I want to do a table. But you, but you just, in some of the field one, you want to export yeah. it to like a CSV, maybe yeah. into Excel. So then you would, first thing you would say, um, so the first an R, you, yeah, nothing's another way. You would say, um, so like, um, as data frame, or yeah. as matrix, because yeah. then you and then you can just write dot CSV or write dot yeah. table. Okay. Okay. Um, I don't see, uh, yeah, I don't think it's a direct data frame. Yeah, it didn't work out. <laughs> yeah, I don't think it's a direct. Well, that has a data frame. Yeah. So there you could actually do write.csv data frame print in parentheses, data frame parentheses, the object name. So you get the data for so the okay, yeah. now I got out something like that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, save, save this to the data. So okay. you don't do save. So if you do save, you might just do some internal R format. Yeah. Uh, so so with you, in this case, what you want to use is um, In some ways, that what we were talking about earlier, um, traditionally you, you think about a model performance is something you get out of the model fitting, so some internal measure, p-values and r-square. Um, the problem with that is, of course, that the more data points you have and the more variables you have, you get, a, you, know, you get better and better fit. But you're not really sure if it's just overfitting, so just being, you know, giving too many degrees of freedom, so to speak, to, to a model. Um, right, you, you can, um, oh yeah, I can just do this, right? 
Why, why? So if you have this in two dimensions, these are your data points. Um, you know, you can, of course, come up with some algorithm that starts happily fitting that. And I say an R square of one. Great model, right? Maybe. Maybe. But maybe the next sample of the data is actually, well, that's pretty good, but not that good. Something like that. And, well, there's some fit, but it's not that great. Because really, the relationship was um, something like that. And there's noise around that. So, so there's always this, this, this problem with, you know, if you have enough variables, enough data points, you, know, you can, of enough variables in particular, you can, you can you know, in, in a flexible method, you can fit anything. Typically what we want, what we seek is generality, that, that you get a general model that also predicts well to unseen points for another sample. And that's where cross-validation comes in. Um, so here's just a very simple example, a very basic example, maybe not simple, I don't know, for, for cr how cross-validation works. I just uh, set it up. So, so this first thing, set seed, um, you see it a lot in our examples. So we use, I used in this example, like in many other examples, we use randomly created data. You know, a lot of the R examples, you see that in the, in the help files. Rather than using some existing data, you should generate some data. So we generate some random numbers. The problem with generating random numbers is that every, every time they're different. And so it's nice if you have an example that you can repeat exactly. And because these things are not truly random, they're pseudo-random because they're generated by a computer, you can set you can initialize this randomization machine. And then you know that always the sequence that comes out will be the same. So consider this if you say run if, no, our uniform, run the number from the uniform distribution, give me one of them, is this one, the next one is different, and it's always going to be different. You can ask for 10 of them. Now if I set seed to any number you like, triple eight, I run this, these are the numbers I get. I run something else, other numbers. But if I set seed again, you see that this, this sequence is the same as the sequence I had before. So through this set seed, you can regenerate apparently not truly random uh, set of numbers. So that, yes, that's often done. We don't have to do that. Um, but it can be handy if you really want to be able to exactly reproduce a certain result. Well, it's not, it's, it's not necessary, but if you want to be able to reproduce up to the decimal point your results, I would do that. Um, and it's nice. If you write a paper and you, and you have done all your analysis, you want to do your final analysis, I would always do that because then, you know, if you want to later make a change or want to figure out something else, then you have the exact same thing. Rather than something that's very similar, but actually now... This variable is a little bit more important than this variable, and it can be really annoying. You know, you know it, it doesn't matter because it's just another sample. It's, it is annoying. Now you get the question, well, what C do you set? Well, like I, I could do 10, I could do 99, and they're, all, and they're all a little bit different, right? So it's a bit odd. Um, I'm not sure if anyone has another idea about that, but, that's, but I would, uh, and I didn't do it in the past, but now I'm pretty um, uh, focused on that to always try to, to, to set it so that I can you know, exactly reproduce something. And then I just you know, put in my birthday, which of course is the best. That's um, <laughs> where it all started for me. So, okay. So then, I, and I do this, and that's what you always also see stuff like that in in um, you know our help files. It doesn't really matter, but I just I just want to create an x and a y variable. Y goes from 1 to 100, and X is 100 random numbers times 100 plus 1 to 100. So I get a, I intended, let's see if it's true. Well, so you really want to plot Y. Well, let's say plot X, Y instead of reversed order, but kind of a noisy relationship between two variables. That's all I wanted to create, so we have something we can fit a model to see if, you know, how well does X pre X, Y. Or why? Yeah. But if you have questions about what I did here, that's fine. But so I, I, you know, 
There's not much to say about it. Um, all right, so now I have, we have X and Y. Um, and normally you could, you could now say, you know, uh, G is a linear model, Y is a function of X, data equals X, Y, summary. R squared, point four six, et cetera. If you were afraid that this, you know, and this is a simple linear model, so the overfitting is not an issue here at all. Um, this is just a numerical example how you might do cross-validation when it would be the case. So the first thing I do, I do this k-fold function, which you don't really need. All it does is it creates for these 100 records a random number one, two, three, four, or five. So I, I divide them into five groups. You may choose to do 10 groups, I do five. 10 seems to be a little bit better, perhaps a bit more stable. <coughs> K-fold is just a simple function that helps you do that, but you, I guess you could also do it. Basically, it does sample uh, one, two, five, 100, uh, replace is true, something like that. Maybe it does something additional as well. I'm not sure why that function exists otherwise. Um, Okay, now this larger thing. I create an empty list. R is an empty list. It's just, I have it in a container. I can start putting things in. You could do it in different ways, but this is how I chose to do it. And then I have this for loop, for i in one to five. So i is gonna be one in the first loop, two, three, four, five. Maybe I should explain a for loop. You've seen them done in the crash course, right? You know, okay, who, be honest, for loop. Easy, not easy. Who wants, to, wants, who wants me to explain a for loop? Okay, one is enough. Okay, so for loop, for i in, so i is just a variable name. I could have said Norway. I could have said any, any, ver any valid variable name. J, Q, um, var in some sequence. It could be in um, a B, C, but typically it's in, I'll just I again, I like I in one to 10. Do something, let's say print I. So what happened here is that, well, for I in one to 10, do something. Well, what to do, so first I is one and then print one, then I becomes two, print two. We could have make it a bit more fancy. Actually, let's compute something. Let's do I times three. 10 times three is 30. And so, it, so it's, it's, a, it's a very basic construct in programming to do repetitive tasks a, a certain number of times. You have for loops, you also have while loops. You can say while this isn't true, Keep going, and that's often you use if you have to approximate something. While the difference between, you know, while while as I update my number, it's not stable. Keep going until it's the difference between the next loop is small or something like that. Or while this condition hasn't been met, keep going, keep going, keep going until you reach zero or something. Um, in this case, I want to go. I have this five groups, so I want to do something five times. And the first step, I say, well, the test data is this X, Y that I already had, right? These my, my data frame, but only give me those records where K equals I. So in the first time, it will be one. So give me all the records where K equals I. That's, that's pretty tricky. It's very orish stuff. You first have to understand then, what k is equal to y, uh, 1 returns. This is what it returns. Yeah, that's, that's either true or false. So these are the k's. And, that, and you can see now, yeah, the first one is 2, so it's not 1, so that's false. And 1, 1, 1 matches with true, true, true. 3 is false. So it translates this 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 into it's either 1 or not. It's either true or false. And this vector of trues and falses can be used to select the records in x, y. So let's do that. And now if you look at head x, y and head test,
There's nothing in there. That can't be right. Uh, What's i? Oh, no, i is 1. There we go. Head xy once more. Head test. So again, you, you see that the first record well, was false. So that's gone. 41 is gone. And then we had true, true, true. And then again, records are gone. So it only selected those records where that k was 1. And how many do we have? Well, we, we, there were 100 rows, five groups, so we should have about 20. Let's see, and row, test, 20. Cool. I think actually that's what the K fold does. It assures that you, you, you take a, this, if you do the sampling thing, you might have 21 or 19 or so, or 17. K fold makes sure you just get 20. And of course, the, the other part in the trading data, that's where all the records where um, k is not i. So it's not 1, so it's 2, 3, 4, or 5. So that's the other 80%. Right, so we can do k equal equal i, or not equal to i, and that's the inverse. And of course there's many more. You can sum that. True counts as 1, false as 0, so there's 80 of those, 20 of those. And so now we've, we've, we split our data in 20 records for testing, 80 records for training, or 80 records for model fitting, and 20 records for model evaluation. Same, you know, these are synonyms. Um, so then, of course, so we then fit the model using the training data. So now you have a model. Let me go do a summary. Um, get an R square, 0.43. Um, I'm going to use the correlation coefficient. So I say now predict. I have a model, and this is very general in R. You have a model M. This is a linear model that we just fit. And you know, in, in the handout which you're working on today, you, you, you use this predict function with raster stacks. Um, you can also use it with tests, which is a data frame. So we have this model M, and we give it this, these test data and say make predictions for these 20 records. And actually, you actually see the original row numbers here that they had in the 100 records. So these are the predictions for these records that were not used to fit the model. So it doesn't know about them. This is new information. You know, they could be like the, the green line, because it, it didn't know about them. And there's different ways you could now, and this is, this is essentially also what, what um, uh, Tom is going to do with, with, the, with the competition. You know, okay, well, you make predictions, and he's going to compare it to what's known. And because we know what this is, because we have the data, right? This is a prediction based on the 80%, but we actually have the actual data. And then you can, you know, you have to decide on some kind of statistic to use. Here I use correlation. So is there, is there a good, you know, this is probably not optimal, but it's simple. So what's the correlation coefficient between uh, the P prediction and actually that the Ys of the test data, because it's the Y that we're predicting out of the axis. Um, you may prefer a different statistic, but that, that in, in principle doesn't matter. It's the same, same um, cross-validation approach. So now I do that, that, but that's the first time. We only did I equals one now, right? So you have R has now one value, R1. And so the idea with cross-validation is, is you do this k-fold times, so rather than running this once, you do this five times. So let's, re let's restart, do this five times. Now we have five values. And you see it's, it's, it's good to do this probably a couple of times because we had a 0.77, but that was, that was great, but the next one was 0.53 and another 0.77, but clearly these are very high outliers and the average should be um, uh, quite a bit lower. Uh, this is a list, I guess you could do mean, uh, you, know, you could do on list r, and then you could take the mean of that. Or you can do this, do call. Uh, it's an odd thing you'll go, oh, and it gives, some, <laughs> it gives a different answer. Well, that's interesting. I don't know what it is. And it's not right. It's too high. Yeah, it's the first one, yeah, so it doesn't, 
So why is that mean? Five members, a separate argument. If you call me, come on, list. 